everyone. I'm Loredana Rajab. I'm a physician. I'm a former executive in the biotech industry, currently working as a coach, consultant, and mentor out of Costa Rica. And I'm delighted to be here today joining the Online Prosperity Show. Now, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Online Prosperity Show. I'm your host, Prosper Tarulinga. And today, we've got a guest whose journey is as bold as it is transformative. Now, Loridana, how are you doing today? I'm doing very well. Thank you so much for having me today, Prosper. Absolutely. Well, the pleasure is all mine because for those that are watching right now, Loridana is an accomplished medical professional with over 20 years of leadership experience in the biotech industry. And she's actually taken a courageous leap into the world of coaching and a consulting. She is a certified positive intelligence, health and innovation coach who's actually moved to a new country to start a new life while also embracing the challenge with the same fierce determination that actually earned her second done black belt in martial arts. But I heard there was a little bit of corruption that happened in that particular area. So that's what we're going to be finding out today when it comes to especially that black belt. All right. So if you ever if you have ever wondered what it actually takes to reinvent yourself and thrive on all levels, mentally, physically and spiritually, then I think you're in for a treat today because Loridana is here to spill the bins. Now, Loridana, thank you once again. Biotech industry. There must have been a lot of books that you read. Tell us yeah, a little I bit about that, that probably journey. More than a, yeah, I think it's been more than a library, as I, I actually joke sometimes. It's been a lot of books to read and a lot of experience to go through. It's been an amazing journey. And to be frank, when I first actually went into medical school and then became a physician, I never thought I'm going to have a later career in pharma industry. That was never in my plans. Uh, but what that career has offered me has been really an enormous opportunity to get to know myself, to work on a number of very interesting topics and work with healthcare experts and patients all around the world. Absolutely. Absolutely. And obviously, I think it takes about seven or eight years for somebody to be a a doctor, right? Yes, that's true. So I did six years of medical school. And then from there, I went into residency. Absolutely. And in that time that, you know, you, you, you stayed in there for about two decades. What was the sort of experience like, you know, being a doctor? Because I always think doctors have the most fun and the nurses do all the work. Well, being a doctor has been really an extremely fulfilling experience, but doctors do the work as well. And when you are a young doctor, you do the work of a nurse as well. So <laughs> I'd say I've witnessed both sides. You have to know medicine, you know, uh, or from all perspectives, because you cannot be a good doctor if you don't understand the work of other healthcare professionals, which are taking care of a patient in the hospital or in a, in a physician's office. So I've been exposed to all those areas. It's been an extremely fulfilling journey. And, uh, you know, something that I have to say, I maybe regretted for many years after going to pharma industry that I didn't continue and I was really missing it until I understood that with this new career path that I was taking in the pharma industry, I had actually this, you know, the same purpose of taking care of patients, but I was just doing it in a very different way. Absolutely. Because when you're a doctor, you're looking after people when they're at their worst. You know what I mean? Nobody goes to a doctor when they're happy and all smiles and things like that. It's usually when, you know, the check engine light has started going on and, you know, things are not the best. And that's that's a lot of care that a doctor has to, you know, do because so many people are not in the right frame of mind right there. No, I agree. And this is why, you know, for as a doctor, you need to have a really big heart to understand not just the illness aspect of, you know, of that particular person, but also the human experience, uh, you know, as they go through a particular, uh, you know, illness. Uh, but, and yeah, you see them at their worst when they come to you first, but you also see them at their best 
when they are actually sending them back home, when you see them responding to a particular treatment, which brings a lot of satisfaction. You feel like you're really having a great purpose in life. Absolutely. So becoming a doctor, obviously, is one of those professions that if you ask a kid, yeah, what do you want to be? Either a lawyer, a doctor, some people want to be a fireman or things like that, because this is sort of a career that is in the public eye and people can or kids can sort of point out and say, that's what I want to be. Was that the case with you or how did you, how did you end up in, in the medical field? Yeah, I would say that it's been probably something that I wanted to do. I was playing the, uh, the doctor when I was a child, quite frankly. I had syringes and needles and stuff that I was playing with other kids. It's also been something that my parents wanted for me. But in my case, it wasn't really an extra pressure or how should I say it was. I wasn't forced into it because I enjoyed it. Uh, and I, you know, the, the connected domain is the one that I had to study to get into medical school, such as biology, chemistry, physics. And so I really enjoyed during my middle school and the high school time. So for me, it was no, no real effort. I could see myself easily as a doctor in the future. And this is what I, I felt it's, it's natural for me to do. Fantastic. But when you then sort of took a different path, did that not um, disappoint, especially the parents that wanted this for you? Um, <clears throat> that's an interesting personal story. Um, actually, um, and yes, I would say the answer is yes, it disappointed them. But by that time, I was no longer really speaking with my parents because I had to take a very interesting decision, which completely changed my life. When I decided to be with my husband, uh, you know, the man that I love, my family didn't agree with my decision. So I was pretty much asked to take a different path. So even if I know that my decision and my decision then to change my career from being a physician to going to the dark side, as many people are saying, uh, you know, in the pharma industry, uh, you know, that happened after I actually split with my with my family. Uh, but I know they, you know, for them, if we have, we would have still been in a relationship, it would have been definitely a disappointment. And at that point in time, when I took this decision, it was 99, 2000, you know, people going, the physicians going to, into the pharma industry, they weren't necessarily appreciated for that move. But for me, it was a move that I had to do for financial reasons, because earning, you know, the earnings for a young physician in a Romanian hospital, you wouldn't believe it during those years, how low the pay was. But on the other hand, also something that I felt like maybe I can do something different. I can learn a new set of skills. I always plan, by the way, to go back to, to medicine. That was always my plan. I said, I'll spend a few years in the pharma industry and I'll go back. Well, I think my career became interesting enough that I was never really, let's say, wanting to make the decision and go back. Mm. But obviously when you're looking at it in the grand scheme of things, even though the pay was uh, small, like you say, but at least it was stable, you know, going into the unknown, especially in the world of coaching and, and sort of consulting, you never know where your next paycheck is going to come from. Were you not afraid? I would say back then when I moved from, uh, hospital to pharma industry, I was definitely going for a job that was better paid. When I moved, however, when I changed from pharma industry, from uh, you know my, my executive role into coaching and consulting, as you very well said, you never know when the next paycheck is coming. It wasn't, yeah, I think from the outside, it seems like a courageous decision. For me, it felt very natural because I knew, and I knew for a number of years already that probably my place should be somewhere else. I felt it somewhere in my bones. But I was never in the place to make the decision yet until 2022, I think it was when I said, yes, now the time has come. So for me, it was a very natural decision to follow what, what my heart was yearning to do, to really, again, look after people, but in a very different way, not as a physician, but as a coach. So in this way, it didn't feel for me like a courageous decision. It felt like a very natural next step. Mm -hmm. I mean, obviously, you, you keep repeating that it felt so natural that, you know, you don't understand why other people saw it as um, courageous. Yeah. Maybe you can walk us through that sort of mindset and, 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 and how you actually managed to stay confident 
during such a significant life change because so many people would have been like whoa whoa what are you thinking and and the dates that you're talking about this is just you know post pandemic and everything had no the dust had not even settled yeah that that's that's correct remember that i made previously another courageous decision to follow my heart to be with my husband despite everything that my family wanted so i already had the experience that when you follow your heart everything is going to go well even if in the beginning things might not show up as great and people might criticize in the beginning and say you have done a you have taken a crazy decision but i had the proof over time that actually that was the right decision so maybe this gave me confidence and when the time came to make a second maybe equally courageous decision to follow my heart but in a very different way this time to you know go for a different profession that allowed me to follow what i thought is my life's purpose to really bring out the best in people you know for me because i had that prior experience i think it felt more natural and i knew that no matter what you know if even if i'm going to face tough times it's going to be okay in the long run now this doesn't mean that i wasn't afraid after i took the decision i tell you that one year after i took this decision i was probably at the lowest point of this journey of this new journey i was in deep fear um i thought that nothing that i you know initially when i did the change i thought i i gave myself 3 years and i said i have 3 years to figure things out you know i had some savings i said okay i'll figure it out you know i'll train myself i'll try to leverage everything that i know the people that i know and so on. so i have 3 years seemed like a good timeline but one year into this journey i was already really afraid because things were nothing went as i thought <laughs> frankly speaking moving to a new country a country that i was not i'm not allowed to formally work uh, but i can build a business which is very important a country that i don't speak the language of i'm learning it still so i don't think i realized all the challenges that i had is ahead of me and i started to become afraid last year and that fear it was actually exactly one year ago i remember the time really really well and i have to say that fear led me to also to make some bad decisions i don't regret those decisions though uh because it taught me a lot about who i truly am and it taught me that i can overcome no matter how hard it is i can overcome those challenges um uh, but yes i'm not saying you are not getting you are not becoming afraid along the way but i think what i realized is that i have to stay true to what was the original purpose for which i made this change and mm -hmm. i think that was my guiding light the other piece that really helped me and i think without that i probably wouldn't be here speaking to you today <laughs> frankly is the what i invested in my personal development both from a mental perspective but also from a spiritual perspective and i think that helped me recontextualize the whole challenge that i was facing and again maybe not just one challenge several challenges so on multiple levels and recontextualize them and see them maybe as opportunities opportunities to maybe further strengthen certain capabilities that i you know i had to work on opportunity to actually experiment more be more brave reach out and ask for help you know look for innovative avenues to do what i was planning to do so in the end it was probably what happened it was the best opportunity for me to relook at some of the premises on which i was building my future life and reinvent myself once more mm -hmm. I mean your journey like you're saying moving to a new country starting a whole new job <laughs> having to learn a whole new language while you were saying all of that I was just ticking some of the boxes of the things that you had had to do obviously you knew no one except um the people you would have been just really yeah. close to and you just sort of if I'm allowed to say this sort of detach yourself from the people that that you knew so it would have been a really lonely um existence yet it's actually the time that you then went within and started spec uh, you know exploring who you're now becoming so your journey to really becoming your true self is is very empowering for a lot of people you know what i mean now how has this sort of inner transformation now influenced uh, your approach uh to coaching your clients Yeah, that's a good question. Let me uh go back to the, our previous question just very briefly and then I'll come back to this one. So one realization that I had 
and this is something which haunted me for maybe a week or two, is uh, uh, it was shortly after I launched my business and I thought that it didn't get the traction that I was hoping to get initially. And I realized I was no longer, I was a nobody pretty much at that point in time. That's how I felt, you know, after being, I assume, somebody in my previous career and my previous professional life. But then I had a liberating moment as I was walking here in, in a park uh, in this beautiful uh, nature of Costa Rica. Um, I was actually had a realization that I, you know, I was not nobody. For the first time in my life, I was somebody. I was my true self for the very first time. And I think that's something that completely changed my perspective. That liberated me enormously. And this is something which I want people to keep in mind, that you are always, when you make such a decision, when you leave everything behind, when you start all over fresh, as you said, with nothing, no connections, no roots, no community, no nothing, no language, and so on, you know, you have to believe in yourself, as you very well said, go within and realize that you have an opportunity to be your true self, completely, authentically, your true self. Absolutely, because half of the time when, <clears throat> you know, when, when you're in a place that you already know, people have already put you in that box of oh, Loredana yes. is a doctor. She's this sort of a woman. Uh, she went to this sort of school and you've got that sort of, um, what, what do you call it? Like it's, it's like a stain or it's like a remnants of who you were yes. and you just live according to that. And so many people don't even venture to want to change that narrative because they just don't want to disrupt the status quo. But as you say now, when you now go to a different country, you literally have to introduce yourself every single time. And people are like, oh, so what's your story? And guess what? You literally can reshape that story the way you want it to be. And I like how you say you literally become somebody because we become attached to who we were whereas we can actually become that which we can be but you went ahead and maybe i don't know if i've skipped timelines but i noticed you created a mental resilience program for high school students what yeah why why, why students or were they the only people that could listen at that time um, no, so this comes from one one thing. So I actually, once I started, uh, you know, this new life here in Costa Rica, I started to do a lot of things that I didn't do before. I was actually running away from them. Like, for example, working with the school where my daughter is going has never been <laughs> on my radar because I never had time. So part of me trying to build a new life here, I had to build a new community. And obviously I started to, to work with a parents association. I started to work closer with, you know, with a school, with the, uh, I, I get, I got more familiar with what was going on. In the meantime, I was advancing with my mental fitness practice. This is something which I adopted my coaching practice and this, you know, the program that I did, not just the initial program, but also the a mastery program, six months mastery program has been a game changer. It has been a life saver for me, definitely. And what I realized throughout this training is that if I knew all these things when I was a teenager, I would have lived my life very differently. I would have not suffered so much. I would have not been so stressed. You know, I would have not been so angry with a lot of things. I would have looked at life very differently. I would have uh, approached challenges in my life very differently. So I said, why not actually try to give a chance to teenagers, you know, these generations? I didn't have the chance because this knowledge wasn't available back then. But why not try to give a chance to the teenagers now to actually learn about mental fitness, to learn about how to deal, you know, with the two voices in their in their mind, frankly, the one which is telling you everything is bad and the other one which is telling you actually this is an opportunity and give them a chance to live their lives differently, the way I would have loved to live my life. So this was the beginning of the conversation. And I actually had a, several sessions with high schoolers uh, I'm also working with uh, with um, teenagers and young adults actually right now, and I have to say I'm. It's really impressive to see how eager they are to learn about these things, how much need there is uh, at their age to actually understand what's going on in their mind and how to turn their mind into a best friend rather in, than being their worst enemy. 
which happens a lot of times, especially now post COVID, especially now with so much exposure, exposure to digital technology being so much present on social media and so on, without knowing exactly how to manage this overwhelming information. Absolutely. I mean, obviously, I, I absolutely believe the position that you have taken is such a pivotal position because your focus is on body, mind, and spirit, right? And yeah. in essence, you know much about the body from your medical experience. Um, the mind in and of itself, what you went through, who you became, and the you know the relationships that emanated from that has a lot of mindset involved in that. And then the spirit is the journey that you took yourself, you know, in, in that sort of self discovery. Now, how are you sort of integrating all these aspects into your coaching so you can help uh, your clients achieve, you know, that sort of sustainable, positive change that, that yeah. people really need? This is a very much a personalized approach because, you know, it depends very much on what the person that I'm working with is ready to hear and work with. Some people are just coming to me because they have some health issues or, you know, that they want to work on or they, you know, they want to work on a couple of preventative strategies. Obviously, health is not just body. And this is the conversation that I'm having with them early on. But other people are actually very much into, you know, what can I do to become a better person, a better leader, you know, uh, how can I change my career? What can I do? And then we have a lot of conversation about what's holding you back, you know, or what could help you advance on all those topics. And mind is a big part of that. On the spiritual side, you know, it's more about what's my life's purpose. You know, what what do I feel called to do? You know, um, but for people that want to go beyond that, there are also topics that I can talk about because I, you know, I'm working with a couple of spiritual mentors and spirituality has been a big part of my, of my life as well. I actually started my spiritual journey 30 years ago. I started it when I was already three years into martial arts and becoming an advanced practitioner. That was a requirement actually, or part of the next step, because martial arts is not just about physical movement. It's a lot beyond that. And that was the first time when I heard about spirituality and what maybe lies beyond just the body and the mind. And I became interested in it. And it's been a really a very rewarding journey. I have to say, however, that probably the, I paid the most attention to spirituality in these past two years because I had a lot more time and I was more ready to go into it, you know, wholeheartedly. Absolutely. Because, I mean, with, with all this combination of things so many coaches some which i end up talking to on the show have only maybe broken a nail and they felt that pain and now they are telling others you know what to do or they went on a weekend and walked on some calls and they felt inspired and on their way back from that they bought obviously band-aids and a laptop and now they've become a coach but for you this has been a lot of lived experience, you know, from everything that you have done. And now you're mentioning, um, you know, the, the, the martial arts aspect to all of this. I know it's very fascinating. I thought the martial arts came in just because you want to beat people, you know, into submission and then they can follow your, um, you know, your teachings. But how has this martial arts training influenced your leadership style and approach to challenges? Yeah, I think initially it was, I started martial arts because it, well, more mostly because I wanted to feel more self-confident and it was also some, uh, you know, a way of feeling more safe because the country I was living in back then, Romania, wasn't the, the safest uh, country at the time. So as a woman, I wanted to feel more safe. Um, so that kind of was the start of the journey, but I have to say it has shown me, uh, it had taught me a lot about myself, about my limits, uh, about how I can look at, you know, how I can push the barriers, the boundaries for, for myself. It was a lot of work. I was not a talented martial artist. So it was uh, whatever I, I, I got during this journey, it wasn't because I was super talented. It was because I worked very, very hard, but I think it really made me a stronger person. 
it helped me work on my mindset as well and understand how to approach uh, you know things differently it also actually helped me and this this came very uh, came very handy later on in my journey in my career as a uh, in the pharma industry but also when i did innovation uh, one of the mottos in, uh, in our dojo was expect the unexpected so that's something which helped me become a better strategist as an example uh, you know uh, try to anticipate in, in this respect and try to understand on how if you are in a competitive environment how to behave how to handle it how to try to find the advantage points and so on so it's been it helped me in a lot of domains as i mentioned but probably the biggest win that i had is that this is where i met my husband <laughs> the man that i love i love and i still love and we've been together now for 31 years so that has been probably the biggest win <laughs> So not only did you fall in love with the art, but um, yeah, in all this pushing and shoving, you know, romance uh, built up. So would that be the reason why you stuck in? Because now you're second Dan Black Belt, right? Yes, I am. What What does that's that mean? Uh, well, uh, it means, that, so that's the second level after you get the Black Belt, because the Black Belt is considered in many ways the beginning in martial arts, <laughs> which might sound very strange for people that are practicing, frankly speaking. Uh, it took me actually, as I mentioned, it took me longer than maybe for other practitioners to get there. Once, because my husband, he is very strict when it comes to the requirements. Um, and uh, I guess I had to marry him <laughs> to get the black belt and the second and black belt eventually. Corruption uh, in because, the dojo. Yeah, exactly, exactly. But I also had to work very, very hard, probably double as hard as other people because as i mentioned i wasn't i wasn't the most talented but i was fully dedicated absolutely now for me what you're relating to us here is somewhat of a a pattern break okay so just hear me out a little bit i mean for somebody who was obviously in in the medical profession and you had this thing happen to you that took you on a quest, on a journey, which then led to your own self-discovery. And now you're sending the elevator down, helping others be, do, and have a happier existence based on the experience that you have gone through. It, it kind of feels like you're going to Costa Rica and all this is somewhat of a, a um, rite of passage you know, where, you know, you had to actually go through this so that maybe you'd have a good story to tell. I don't know. I don't know how you feel um, about that sort of reference in, in the way that you have now, um, you know, showcased and, and are, are presenting yourself now. No, I, I agree. I think you're right. And uh, that's why I said in the beginning, this move here, this change wasn't did require any courage. It felt like the very natural uh, ne next step. And it might be, as you said, because of everything else that has happened in my life, all the things that I've been exposed to, and because everything that I've done has given me another opportunity to look at myself and see who am I, who do I want to be next. Every, you know, every change, uh, I'm not sure I mentioned this before, but Costa Rica is my sixth country. So I've been changing a lot. Yeah, I've been doing a lot of moves. This one was the only move where I, that I did by myself. Everything else was facilitated by my job through my company. But nevertheless, every single time it was a new beginning. I was confronted with myself again, asking myself the question, who am I? Who do I want to be again? You know, what are my strengths? What can I learn from this? You know, where can I go next? Not just career-wise, but also human-wise. You know, mm. so it's been, I think it's been a very profound self-discovery journey, must by a career path, <laughs> Absolutely. but it was always, it was always me at the center of everything that was going on. I just didn't realize it fully until I came here. Absolutely. And for those that are watching right now, you know, if they consider wanting to maybe get started in learning a thing or two about what it is that you do, what would be the best um, way for people to get a hold of you, uh, Lorelai? Uh, well, the best way would be maybe to go to my website, uh, you know, which is loradanarejeb.com. All my contact details are there. You can write me an email. You can send me a WhatsApp message, whatever feels more convenient for you. I'm here to help anyone. Again, I have a lot of experience. You said it before. I'm never 
guiding people, I'm never coaching people or telling them anything which I haven't tried myself. So I have the direct experience of whatever I'm saying. Uh, so I hope that this is something that will help people live their lives to the fullest. Absolutely. And it, uh, we'll make sure that all those links are in the show notes below so that people can actually get started on this journey. I mean, because you've got this experience, like you said, you've worked in leadership roles in various um, you know, geographies that meant you're meeting different people in different states and in different um, you know, manner and ways of life so much that it opens you up to just about anyone that might come through and you'll be able to um, help them in a way. But also part of what you are doing and have been doing for a lot of people um, is, 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 is a lot of innovation. So what role does innovation um, play within your, your coaching and, you know, how, how are you staying ahead of the curve and rapidly, you know, evolving in this ever changing world of ours? Yeah. Yeah. Innovation has been a big part of my life uh, uh, already from when I was working in the pharma industry, because obviously I was working for an innovative company. So innovative drugs were part of, uh, you know, uh, what part of was what I was doing. But I also wanted to bring more innovation. And one of the, so I, I became really in love with innovation when I was working in Canada. And together with a team that I had there, we built an innovation center. And I trained in innovation. I did a course with e Cornell, but also an innovation coaching course with, uh, with a uh, famous coach from Australia. In fact. So this is kind of how I, I really became very familiar with innovation. Now, I decided to adopt it in my practice because everything I do, especially when we deal with problems in life, in career, in relationships, in anything, requires different thinking, requires that we change paradigms, requires that we recontextualize the whole situation. And what better domain than innovation is to do that? So mm -hmm. I'm using actually, even if I'm not right now, I don't have, uh, I'm not working with someone on innovation. Well, actually, sorry, that's not true. I'm working on a couple of innovative initiatives for healthcare in African countries. I'm working with a company on that. But putting that aside, I'm using innovation in my coaching practice because, again, techniques that I've learned, some of them are part of the positive intelligence curriculum, but some of them are things that I learned in my innovation practice uh, in the previous company or in the coaching training. And I'm using them to ask different questions for people, to ask them to rethink the whole and come with different solutions. Things that they might have thought are impossible through these conversations and using innovation strategies, they all of a sudden see, oh, this is actually possible. I thought I have one option. Now I have maybe 10, <laughs> you know? So this is what I, why I love innovation and why I love using it in my coaching practice as well. Absolutely. I think it was Einstein that said the thinking that got us here is not going to take us out of uh, whatever predicament or situation that we're Correct. in. So many people um, would have come into 2020 and noticed that what they were used to or the life that they were used to no longer exists. And now they have to literally innovate in order to stay, um, you know, relevant. And in your case, you've reinvented yourself so many times and so many uh, instances that I don't know if you can even recognize yourself right now, but that's a story for another day. Now, you've taken your taken it upon yourself to start working with um coaching teens and their parents uh obviously because like you said yourself yeah. you know you wish um you know somebody would have told you these in things while you were younger but maybe if we could actually do that and let's say you are now the uh, loridana who's going back in time and maybe lecturing to the younger Loredana at that time, you know, based on the bold decisions that you've made throughout your life, what would you tell your younger self, um, you know, in, in, in light of who you've become and what, what they can expect? That's a great question. I actually thought about this quite a few times, especially when I was in front of teenagers and I was trying to see myself in the audience and say, what would Loredana, you know, the 16, 17, 18 years old Loredana say or do or think when she would hear these things. But what I would tell my younger self is don't be afraid. You know, take this, look at this as your greatest opportunity in life. 
turn it into your biggest gift. This is what I would tell her. Because, you know, this strength, this capability of changing our lives and using, you know, the, the challenging situation which are being thrown our way, sometimes created by ourselves, sometimes created by outer circumstances which are not in our control. You know, these are oftentimes our biggest gifts as long as you are able to see them in the moment. Most of the time we can see them 20 years later or five years later, you know, which is still great. But what, what, how would, you know, what would it be like if you could feel that in the moment? Just imagine the life you could live if you could realize that in the moment. Mm, absolutely, because so many people waited till they were told they were non-essential. And that's a that's the worst place to be in to realize that whatever you've been building towards, nobody really needed it for the last two years or three years. So I, I feel like what you're saying is very, very important. Now, obviously, you're a fan of innovation. You're a fan of reinvention and things of that nature. What's next? What can we expect from Loredana? Um, hmm, I don't know, because I have to say, even working with parents and teenagers wasn't in my plans two years ago, or even one year ago, frankly speaking. So it happened. And I just embraced the opportunity because it was such a phenomenal one. So I don't know, we'll have to connect in one year and I'll let you know where I am. <laughs> well, I think I think you need to document this and uh, deliver a book if that's not uh, part of what you're working on right now, Loredan. I appreciate the challenge. I am going to take this into consideration for sure. Absolutely. Because your life story and your experience have so much value for so many people that have been obviously displaced by the recent activities. And it's only going to get worse with the coming years, you know, and I feel like some people work best when they have like a roadmap because you can't connect the dots looking forwards you can only connect the dots looking backwards and if they can see somebody That's who's true. been there done that and experienced it then they too can essentially be do and have a happier existence so now that you've accepted the challenge we're gonna have to have you back on the show so that you can launch the book when it's done I'll be very happy to. Oh, I only have one year, so I'll better start working on the book right now. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Whoa. Thank you so much now, Loredana. What an enlightening conversation. I mean, you know, when we got started, I thought we were just going to talk about karate chops, but no, it went a whole lot deeper because I think your story is just a testament to the power of reinvention and really staying true to one purpose because so many of us just get distracted. Like you say, so much digital influence and we're looking at other people's highlight reels and not really looking at the actual work that is needed for us to leave learn and actually contribute so thank you so much for at least shining a light as to what a well-lived life should and could look like so i really appreciate that well thank you that was a very eloquent summary of our conversation i'm going to ask you to write the foreword for my book then <laughs> <laughs> pleasure is all mine i think um you know, when you get to sit down with somebody and they are letting you know what they've been through, it's only apropos to really, you know, give it back in a way that you, you've been with them. So I really appreciate you for sharing this with us today. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me today. It's been a pleasure. I really enjoyed our conversation. Great stuff. And for those that are watching right now, if you found this episode as inspiring as I did, I really encourage you to, first of all, Rewatch this and really soak in on all the valuable insights because while we were talking, you were probably just wanting to know what the next thing is. But now that you know where we're at and what innovation can actually do, you know, you know with your body, mind, and spirit, you should maybe rewatch this. Or if you've gotten everything, share this with somebody who's going through maybe a hard time or is not able to figure out who they are becoming because some, so many of the things that we discussed today with Lorena are in, intended to really help you focus on becoming, all right? So depending on where you are, who you are, or what it is that you're working on, this is something that we all need to um, have the knowledge 
off and full in order for us to be doing have a happier existence and while you're at it don't forget to subscribe to the online prosperity show for more incredible uh, stories and expert advice that can actually help you on your journey to a prosperous life until next time keep thriving bye for now